remembering the traumatic legacy of lynching in our area. Today, a group dug up soil outside the old Baltimore County Jail in Towson. They put it in a jar to remember Howard Cooper. A Cooper was one of more than 4,000 victims of racial terror lynchings in America. No fewer than 40 of these murders occurred in Maryland. Cooper was lynched in 1885, but the seed of his demise may have been planted in 1870 with the passage of the 15th Amendment giving black men the right to vote. There was a major celebration in Baltimore, including a parade and a speech by Frederick Douglass. It represented uh, endless possibilities for the future. The end of slavery as we know it, certainly it was a way of defining freedom uh, for African Americans. It was a way to participate in the political process. The vote represented hope, but that hope faded when faced with the reality of Maryland politics. Democrats controlled state government for decades after the Civil War, and they were hostile to civil rights. Enter the Reverend Harvey Johnson of Union Baptist Church. By 1885, the dynamic young leader recognized that elections may not be the best tool to advance civil rights. He not only read the Bible, he read law. Uh, he read the Maryland Constitution. He read the United States Constitution. He could literally verbatim to give you the Bill of Rights. He, he believed that the full exercise of law was the freedom lever for his people. He has grown frustrated with the state of politics in Maryland. He recognizes that the Democratic Party does not offer any hope. He recognizes that the Republican Party is not going to be an avenue towards change. So he begins to look in other directions. Johnson looked to the courts and in 1885 created one of the nation's first civil rights organizations. So the Brotherhood of Liberty is an organization that was constituted to challenge racial inequality in Maryland through the legal system. Two early wins vindicated that strategy. In February, four black women won damages from a steamer company after being denied first-class passage they had paid for. In March, the state bar was forced to admit black attorneys for the first time. Then, in April, in the Baltimore County village of Rockland, a fateful encounter set off a tragic chain of events. At 6 o'clock, April 4th, 1885, Katie Gray had just gone to uh, the railroad station with her sister. Katie Gray was coming back from the uh, railroad station when she met Howard Cooper. And she had uh, apparently known Howard Cooper before. They had words. Katie turned, started walking home. Howard Cooper followed Katie Gray into the woods where something happened. It's impossible to know the truth of what happened that day. Cooper had a history of harassment. Both later testified that Cooper did accost the girl. After about two hours, Katie Gray's dog, Bruno, comes running out barking and presumably chases Howard Cooper away. Katie Gray runs back to her household and her father uh, is incensed. Her father very quickly figures out what happened. She probably mentions Harry, Howard Cooper's name and within hours, Daniel Gray, Katie Gray's father, puts together friends, I think it's fair to call them a mob, who scour the countryside looking for Howard Cooper. Cooper eludes the mob for five days. The manhunt consumes the county. There is no presumption of innocence. Negro guilty of fiendish assault. The excitement is intense over an outrage committed by a Negro named Howard Cooper. When Cooper is captured, he will be hung up to the nearest tree. This house is built on the foundation of a barn where Cooper hid. A friend told Howard to wait while he went for food. The man soon returned, but not with food. Before long, four people jump Howard Cooper in a barn and bring him to the Towson jail. Word of his capture spread quickly, and soon the jail is surrounded by a mob eager to get their hands on him. 
With the prisoner's life in danger, the sheriff immediately moves him to the Baltimore City Jail. Even there, Cooper attracts a crowd. Uh, wherever they thought Howard Cooper might be, a mob appeared, um, mostly of friends in the community of Rockland. In Rockland and the county, the demand for retribution intensified in the weeks leading up to the trial. Cooper faced charges of assault and rape. The court of public opinion had already reached a verdict. When you look at the coverage of the newspapers, they present it as if there's no doubt that he had raped her. And why the rape charge is important is because the rape charge is what triggered the potential death penalty. On the day of his trial, Cooper was taken to court early as threats were made on his life. Extra police were called in to handle the crush of people trying to get into the courtroom. Muttered threats are heard on all sides, and it is the belief of many that the Negro will yet suffer death at the hands of Katie Gray's friends. The courtroom is crowded to suffocation. Like a lot of the cases in this period, it's hard to say what evidence there was that he actually committed the crime. He admits that he attacked Gray, um, but throughout the trial, he is steadfast in denying that he ever raped her. She doesn't claim rape in the beginning of the trial. The only person that testifies that um, Cooper had raped her was Gray's doctor, who examined her the next day. The trial lasted barely four hours. The jury of 12 white men didn't bother to leave their seats. It took them less than a minute to find Cooper guilty of both counts. The Sun breathlessly named it the most shocking crime ever perpetrated in Maryland. He returned to court the next day and was sentenced to death. Cooper was held in Baltimore while his lawyers filed an appeal to the state's highest court claiming his 14th Amendment rights had been violated because blacks were excluded from the jury pool. They knew the state appeal had little chance of succeeding, but it bought them time to raise funds to file an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. What Harvey Johnson is hoping to do is to bring this case out of the state courts. He doesn't have much hope that the state courts are going to rule in favor of him, but he does hope that if he can get a case to the Supreme Court, then the Supreme Court will rule on the federal level that what's happening in the state is unconstitutional. So while the Maryland court considered Cooper's state appeal, Johnson got to work raising money for a federal appeal. I think the possibility of this appeal to the Supreme Court absolutely magnified the intensity of those persons who felt like, oh my God, he may get away with this crime. So when the white community in Towson learned that the African-American community was getting close to achieving its goal of raising enough money, they were up in arms. I think it quite frankly scared them. They saw in short order that Johnson was successful in these two cases in the, in the previous months before the, the, the Cooper case. And now they see the same person going after the Cooper case as well. And I think they're fearful that he's going to succeed in this case as well. And I think that certainly, um, you know, up the stakes, uh, ratcheted up the tension in this period. On June 23rd, as expected, Cooper's state appeal was denied. The governor signed a death warrant setting the execution for July 31st. Cooper was returned to Towson at the end of June even as Reverend Johnson was nearing his goal. His efforts were aided by the size of his congregation. Can you imagine having 8% of the Negro population, the colored population, members of your church? So he's talking to them every week. And that was amazing power. And they, and they were intellectual leaders, business leaders. And the moment that Harvey Johnson and his parishioners push that fundraising effort over the limit or over the line, there is a very strong reaction by not only the Baltimore Sun, but also some of the papers throughout the state. On Saturday, July 11th, Cooper was 20 days away from his execution. That morning, the Towson paper reported that his lawyers had already prepared the Supreme Court appeal and were only waiting for the money to file it. We think the patience of the people of Baltimore County is being severely tried in this matter. 
There may be a great deal of law in all this nonsense, but we fail to see where justice comes in. That same day, they got the money they needed through the instrumentality of Reverend Harvey Johnson. The appeal would be filed on Monday. They were incensed and they thought this brute is going to get away with it. So we have to take matters in our own hands. By this time, they've been just chomping at the bit to get their chance to lynch Howard Cooper. And they did not want to wait any longer. The next day was Sunday, July 12th. Rumors start to filter through, through the town that something is gonna happen soon. In twos and threes, men collect on the outskirts of town. One man pulls a rope out from underneath his jacket, says, this is a cravat for Howard Cooper. As darkness gathers, groups of masked men converge on the jail. The mob waits until Monday morning, actually 12 midnight, Sunday to Monday, because they didn't want to do a lynching on a Sunday. Just after midnight, a group tries to batter the front door using a flagpole. From the family quarters on the second floor, the sheriff's daughter directs them to the back. There, the mob has an easier time of it. They break the door down, find Cooper hiding under a mattress in his cell, and drag him outside with a noose already around his neck. They waste no time tossing the rope over the branch of a nearby sycamore tree. One witness says the whole affair was orderly and expeditious. And about 40 men pull on one end, lifting Howard Cooper off the ground. He dies of asphyxiation. Usually um, hanging somebody is quick. It breaks somebody's neck. Uh, but in this case, it's a long uh, process of suffocation. The local paper's account begins, the Cooper case has been summarily disposed of without the intervention of the Supreme Court. By three in the morning, the mob had disbanded, leaving Cooper's body hanging in front of the jail in full view. Uh, we know that a train slowed down uh, so that their passengers could look out and see the body. This was about seven o'clock in the morning. His mother came and collected his body around noon of that day, put it in a buckboard and brought it to the church um, on Bologna Road in Ruxton, where he lies today in an unmarked grave. That might have been the end of the story, but renewed interest in these lynchings has prompted renewed scrutiny and new revelations. So uh, I went to the soil collection. After the ceremony, historian Jenny Lyles was determined to learn more about the victim and his family. So here's the 1870 census. It is the 9th district, which is Towson Town. I found him in the 1870 census with his mother, his grandparents, and his twin brother. At the time of his lynching, Cooper was said to be anywhere from 19 to 24 years old. The census tells a far different story. So here you can find Henrietta Cooper, it says Celeste, Howard, Henry, and Howard and Henry, it's six out of 12, so six months. He was six months old. And by 1885, that means he could have only been 15 years old, no more. And that was rather shocking to me, that he, I was no longer looking for a man of 25, that I was looking at a kid. Today, Towson is the Baltimore County seat, a legal center, and a college town. But in 1885, a child was lynched here. What we do with that knowledge, that truth, will determine the kind of community our own children inherit. In order for us, if we're going to, you know, have any meaningful reconciliation, any meaningful progress in, in race relations, we have to understand and know that history. It's too important not to know.